Do any of you have recurring nightmares? Well, y'all are in better shape than I am. I have this recurring nightmare. It happens once or twice a year. I am still in college. And it's final exam time. And I show up for the final exam in English literature. My problem is that I forgot to attend the English literature class. And I sit down at my desk and the exam is on, and I kid you not, Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and it's written in Middle English. I need it to graduate twice a year. Same course, same room. My dad had recurring nightmare. My dad being also, uh, having been a Presbyterian minister, his recurring nightmares is that he got up to preach and had forgotten to put his pants on. And it's one of those nightmares where you're trying to run away, but you're stuck to the floor. Many report those kinds of dreams. Subconsciously, we as humans believe there will be a day of reckoning. And we will take a final exam and we will realize what we have failed to do, but we were supposed to do. The end of the course. And we find we come up lacking. Final exams have been part of human thinking for thousands of years. We wonder how will it all end? Will, will the world go out with a bang or a whimper? <coughs> Excuse me. The Gospels certainly raise the question, how will it end? Apocalyptic literature. The, the parousia. The eschaton. Apocalyptic literature is about major crises in the world. The parousia is about the second coming of Christ. Eschaton is the whole lump together, how it all ends. <coughs> and I will tell you, I don't find, as some do, that the Bible is all that clear about how it all ends. At least not definitively so. The Gospel of Matthew, it's quite apparent <clears throat> that 
the writer believes of the imminent return of Jesus. And Jesus has said in Matthew's gospel, this generation will not pass away until you see the Son of God coming in a cloud of glory with the holy angels. Well, certainly the Jews thought it was the end of the world when Jerusalem collapses under the heel of the Roman Empire and they are dispersed. The diaspora into all parts of the Roman Empire. And as they were being dispersed and hard times came, they looked up. Where was the Son of God coming in the cloud? And where are the holy angels? Now I realize that some take all this apocalyptic stuff and Um, throughout the Bible and weave it into a nice cohesive system about the eschaton, the last day. There are those who believe that when Christ comes, he will rule for a thousand years right here on earth. And then, after that thousand years, those who have passed muster will go up to the heavens and the rest will be left behind. Those are called the post-millennialists, the after thousand year people. Now the pre-millennialists believe that there will be a great rapture And all the good people will fly up. And Christ will come a thousand year rule. And if you can survive that, you just might get into the kingdom. Presbyterians traditionally have been called pan-millennialists. We believe that everything will pan out in the end. Now, Paul, when he writes his first letter in 1 Thessalonians in 51, common era, it is quite apparent that he is living in the last day. And he is writing to the church at Thessalonica who are all panicked that the second coming of Christ has left them behind. And he says, some of you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Today's parable is about ten bridesmaids. Five were wise because they were ready for the groom to come. Five were not so wise because they hadn't brought any extra oil. They were not prepared. But an interesting line in this parable is that the groom is delayed. Here it is, 2020. And the groom is really late. 
about 2,000 years late. Human beings are naturally curious. We want to know how it will all end. What is the end game? In 2013, a scientist was asked to answer the question about the end game, the, the what could happen to us that would extinguish life as we know it. I watched that lecture in preparation this week. You know what the number one thing was? Virus. How viruses tend to mutate. This is seven years ago. Second thing was carbon dioxide emissions. That enough of it is in the air, things will radically begin to heat up And life as we know it would change. And then he talked about the one tree. As we know, trees take carbon dioxide and change it to oxygen. But he said there is an idea that you will get to one tree too many that you will destroy. And it starts a ripple effect that there's not enough oxygen being produced. And it would be almost impossible to stop it. Volcanic activity. Nuclear war. A massive solar flare. They've had some experience with solar flares shorting out in certain parts all electrical. He said, it's, those are just bare, those are missing us. But if we took a direct solar flare, it would catapult us into the Middle Ages. There'd be no electronics. Which wouldn't bother me because I don't have a cell phone. Meteor strikes. How will it all end? We're curious. When I was small, my parents used to drive to see my grandparents. And that's before the interstate system. And to get 500 miles, it would take hours and hours in small towns. But being a little hyperactive, 20 minutes down the road, I would ask, are we there yet? No, it will be a while. It seems to me, historically looking, there would have been, there have been many times that it would have been beneficial for the second coming of Jesus. Certainly, the fall of Jerusalem and the scattering of the Jewish people, because Matthew is writing to Christian Jews. Or maybe the time of the barbarian, barbarians at the gates of Rome in the time of the Holy Roman Empire. Or what about in the 14th century, the combination of the Hundred Years' War and the bubonic plague, the Black Death, and between the two, eradicated two-thirds of almost all of Western Europe? 
that would have been a really good time. The war to end all wars was World War I and combined that with the Spanish flu. That would have been a good time. And I personally can remember the Cuban Missile Crisis and the fear it shook in all of us setting off a, a massive uh, publication that we are in the end times. Are we there yet? Where is the groom? I speak of lenses often, things that we read through, things that we filter through, perspectives that we have, our presuppositions that we bring to a text. And often it strikes me that we read these apocalyptic texts or about the second coming of Christ or anything that's eschatology-minded through a lens of a certain perspective of time. The one that is most familiar to us. The Greeks call it chronos. A chronometer. Do you have a chronometer on today? I have one. It's 1030 for those of you who are interested. We call this a watch, which is real interesting. Watch. But another perspective of time is Kairos, often referred to as God time. This time, fullness of time, eternal now in Tolikian terms. It's all time. From this point into the future. And for each one of us here today, there will be a time when our chronos time will run out. And this reflection this morning is very personal. Since I've been with you so long, if you will bear with me, it's about are we there yet? And we're here. My mother is 93. She lives in Dallas. His own hospice. So a few weeks ago, I, I, I just knew I had to go see her and I had to get COVID tests and the real one that you have to get in the lab and so on before they would let me into this apartment complex where seniors live and I had my masked visit and then later on in the day I drove back to San Antonio and during that masked visit I she asked for a prayer, and I sat next to her and put my arm around her. And 
I prayed, but when I left, I had this haunting feeling. There was still something left to be said. And I didn't know how to say it. I told my sister to call me right before she would start to lose consciousness. And I would get there as fast as I could. The call came in on Thursday. So I jumped in my car and drove to Dallas. And thinking, I don't know what I'll say, but there's something left to be said. She told my sister that I was coming, and my mom said, I don't know if I can wait. But she did. When I spoke to her, she did open her eyes. And we sat for a number of hours. She didn't say anything. Even as I'm saying this, I talked to my sister at 9.30 this morning, and she's there. But not quite yet. For this day will be her last. I said, Mom, I, I have to drive back now. And she was able to get these words out. The next time I see you, we'll be in heaven. I got to tell you. And that shook me up. And I said to her with my hands on her forehead, go with God. And I said, in Texas, we say, vaya con Dios. And the last words she said, not to me, but said, Vaya con Dios, son. Vaya con Dios. I can tell you, I stumbled to the car. Go with God. No matter the chronos, there is Kairos. God's time. And perhaps it just is that God's time is the presence of Christ, the eternal now. Our clock runs out. But God's clock never does. And it just may be the second coming 
is what Jesus says in John. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you will be also. And she said to me, next time I will see you in heaven. And I remember now, I said to her, well, I think you're going to have to come for me because I may lose my way. Perhaps the second coming is the peace in our leaving. And the peace in those who are left behind. The comfort in our going. Even as we are going. For those who leave, for those who are left behind, for those on Kronos, for those who have entered into Kairos, the gospel would tell us via con Dios go with God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen
the Lord may be spirit by among us. Keep us safe full of your word. Give us boldness to stand firm as we proclaim it. Be with those who live in the midst of suffering, that your presence may bring them healing, strength, and hope. We pray for those who are dying, give them a confident trust in Jesus' resurrection. That they may be prepared for life eternal. Hear the cry of the needy and save them. Comfort the hearts of those who struggle. And give them hope through grace. Fulfill the desire of all who live in your family and who love to call upon you. For we pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us also to pray, saying, Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed and turned over to the authorities, he took the bread and the upper room. After he had given thanks, he did bless it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken. For you can do this in remembrance of me. Afterwards he took also the cup and he gave it to them, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood for the remission of your sins. All of you drink from it. May the Lord bless you. May His grace rain down upon you. May that grace, like healing water, restore your soul. Go forth and let your light shine before all people, that they know our God is the living God. And our God is one who restores in all the broken places. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.